Fire dispatch, engine 271, check the availability of airlift. Airlift Northwest. Okay, what kind of patient do we have? And what is our ground contact? And what frequency? All right, you have airlift 2, be there in about 15 minutes. I'm Lisa Davidson. I'm a pediatric flight nurse at Airlift Northwest. The mission of Airlift Northwest is to serve the Whammy region, that's Washington, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho, and transport those critically ill patients with the best possible care that we can give. So we're not just transporting them, we're caring for them, we're bringing that specialized care to the referring facility or the scene, and then continuing that care until they get to definitive care. We provide critical care in the air. We can get you from point A to point B in a very short amount of time, and that helps to save your life. So we operate a variety of aircraft from two types of rotary wing aircraft and two types of fixed wing aircraft. We fly about 3,200 missions a year, um, a mix of adult and pediatric flights, trauma and medical flights as well, a mix of field responses as well as interfacility. Our helicopters fly at about 150 miles an hour. So I can be from Seattle to Bremerton in seven minutes, as an example. It's a pretty quick way to get back and forth. We have two flight nurses on every flight. It's an adult nurse and a pediatric nurse. The advantage of this is we can pretty much tackle any mission, basically starting the highest level of care the second that our crew reaches that patient. When we receive a patient from Airlift Northwest, uh, we know that they've received the best of care from the start. The training and the expertise of those Airlift Northwest nurses is second to none. I think we need to start a second IV. They receive their training from UW Medicine physicians, bringing UW Medicine protocols to the bedside of the patient or to the scene of the accident. Airlift really is a critical care air transport team. But we transport patients anywhere from zero to 100. We transport premature babies, 25 weeks, that are born early that need to come to definitive care at Children's Hospital or Mary Bridge. We transport adults who are septic and critically ill and need to be transported from, say, Grace Harbor to Harborview Medical Center. We transport cardiac patients. We transport elderly, like an elderly gentleman who fell off of his roof and now has a head bleed. So huge range of patients, huge range of diagnoses, basically anywhere we're asked to go. My name is Patrick Ledoux. I'm a lieutenant with King County Fire District 27. I think it's appropriate to call it Airlift Northwest any time that you have a time constraint. The time to deliver the patient to the hospital is critical due to traffic concerns, extended extrication. Let's dispatch a medic unit, engine for an LZ setup, and launch airlift. John, we get on the straps. We're doing good on the straps. We're waiting for the head to get strapped in. When we're talking to first responders, the the things I think that they look at when they're calling us are mechanism of injury, severity of illness, if they need to come to a level one trauma center. The other things that they consider, I think, as well are traffic. Maybe traffic is too heavy for them to get to where they need to go in that golden hour, and that's where airlift can come in and deliver the patient. And then another consideration is the severity of illness. If they need critical care support for the transport, that's a good reason to call us as well. Airlift Northwest always encourages people to go ahead and call them early, get them prepared, let the pilots get out, put them on standby, let them decide whether on the weather and GPS settings if it's appropriate for them to fly. That helps cut down the time for the transport to the hospital as well. If you think you're gonna need us, please call us. We'll get into the aircraft, we'll start heading towards you. And if you don't need us, you can call us off, but if you need us, we're that much closer. Putting them on standby, even asking for them to come and having to counsel them is not a bad thing because you're still doing what's best for the patient. Engine 271, arriving at the LZ, establishing LZ command. So when we determine who's gonna be LZ command or who's gonna be in charge of the landing zone, that officer or that unit is then assigned to a different attack frequency. Up here about 50 feet where this clearing is. LZ command's responsibilities are to make sure they establish an area that's safe for the pilot to land. Airlift, this is uh, LZ command. They have positive communications with them. Their also responsibility is also to clear the area. All right, I want you to just uh, double check the zone for debris. Sometimes we land a helicopter or a baseball field and there's a baseball game going on. We'll literally clear the field and ask people to 
move out of the way so we can land it because that's the safest place to land. The first responder should relay information about the patient to the comm center that will get to the nurses about the patient's age and the weight, the mechanism of injury, so that we can prepare ourselves while we're on our way. Some of the best ways to notify uh, dispatch or Airlift Northwest on where the landing zone is going to be is GPS. Try to get GPS coordinates. Almost every phone has got a GPS on it now and they can give those lat longs to the comm center and we can plug them into our GPS and fly directly to the spot. Occasionally when we're looking for the landing zone and we're having a difficult time identifying exactly where it is, to have some kind of identifier that's different like the big red barn on the left or there's a school to the north. Airlift 2, 1242, your flight 750. Heading for Falls City, Riverfront Park, GPS 113, returning to Harborview. Your ground contact at the LZ Command on channel 201. Comm Center, Airlift 2, going up uh, LZ Command. Choosing a landing zone is actually fairly easy. The biggest thing you want to make sure is that you just want to have good communications with the pilot and the crew that are coming in and you give them a good area for them to land. The most important parts of the landing zone is to give them at least a 100 by 100 feet clearance during the daytime and a 200 by 200 clearance at nighttime. 100 by 100 during the day, 200 by 200 at night. A minimum of 15 by 15 for the aircraft to actually land on. Flat as possible. You don't want it to slope up on either side because then the rotor blades might touch in that area. You want to make sure that it's free of debris. You could set them up in fields, baseball fields, parks. There's several areas that you can set those up in. In rural areas, you just want to look for a flat, clean spot that's got a hard surface for them to land on. Clear spot out here. Okay. I think we start here, 100 by 100. Good spot. There's no uh, power lines or anything. It would be good. So, okay. so grab some cones. You want to make sure that the area is free of gold posts, free of wires, free of anything that might get in the way of the tail rotor or any part of the helicopter. In an ideal scenario, we want to make sure that we prep the landing zone as best as possible for the pilots and the crew. We want to have them have a safe landing. So what we want to do as far as preparation is we want to set out cones in the 100 by 100 clearance. We do like to do a walk around and just make sure the entire area is safe. So we'll walk around, we'll pick up any debris that may jump into the air through the rotor wash. Sometimes it may be too dry or a lot of gravel and if you have the time we'd like to water down the, the landing zone. Sometimes we have set up a landing zone and told airlift we're setting up a landing zone and we actually started doing our walk around and setting up a perimeter and realized it was not an adequate landing zone. At that time it's better to communicate with them that we don't have a good landing zone and that we'd update, update them with a new address or a new area where we land them. Takeoffs are optional, landing is mandatory. So we try to make a determination before we even lift as to whether or not we can safely complete the flight. Airlift, this is uh, LZ Command. We're at the county park at State Route 203. We've got uh, trees to the south and the north. Uh, no power lines. We have a steady wind from the east, about 20 miles an hour. And I see you're approaching from the west. From the landing zone, they usually give information about the weather, which way the wind is blowing, north, south, east, west and if there's any obstacles that they would want to watch out for. And the acronym I use is SO WHAT. S is the suitability of the landing area, O is the obstructions, W is the winds, H is the height of the uh, obstructions, A is the long axis of landing, which I can get from where I'm at, and T is the terrain. By landing the dirt, grass, asphalt, something like that. So that would be probably more than enough information for the pilot. But whatever we hear, we have to um, verify while we're doing our high recon. Nighttime landings are a little bit different. We want to make sure we really give that extra safety factor to them. So we actually increase the landing zone. We make it 200 by 200. We also have a, a visibility issue, so we want to make sure we mark the landing zone appropriately and we have to be really, really diligent about making sure we have clear overhead. We do have night vision goggles, so the nurse and the pilot are both wearing night vision goggles as we land, and they are wonderful. And that helps us identify the fire truck and the medic truck. If they have their emergency lights up and operational and working, we can spot them miles out, and then we can get a visual on them much quicker. And then when we're overhead, that's usually when the pilot will call for them to, get, to shut down the uh, emergency lights. When we're in uh, communication with the pilots, we like to let them 
know what we have so they have a better visual when they're coming in. And they also will tell us what they want as well. So if we have our lights on and they don't want our lights on, we'll turn them off. However, having our scene lighting are good for them when they're overhead and looking for us to, to find the location. But once they're coming in for their approach, we'll turn those lights off for them. Once the, once the helicopter lands, our role is not over yet. We still have to make contact with the flight nurses, transfer the patient, give them as much information as we can about the patient. So the transfer of care from EMS to the airlift nurses usually happens in the back of a medic rig. We usually go in and one nurse will put the blood pressure cuff on and our equipment in place and get report. Well, we got a 35-year-old female found slumped over. Then we I will mean, uh, transfer their equipment off the patient. Ours is on and we take the patient out with oxygen in place. It's going to be okay. We're going to take you in a helicopter back to the hospital, okay? And head over towards the helicopter. We're developing a standardized way of loading and unloading our patients. They do need to be seat belted in. The equipment needs to be on top of the patient, so any IV bags that we're using or syringe pumps will need to be on top of the patient and the patient's hands up and around either underneath the burn pack or safety belted in. We're going to lift on three. One, two, three, six. One person is usually inside the aircraft and one person is outside the aircraft. And then the pilot will assist with loading the patient. If it's in the EC-135, he's usually the one that's lifting the patient up. But we're usually having one or two people on each side just to watch and help him get the patient inside. And then the biggest thing for them is to let them get off safely. So we want to make sure we maintain the perimeter. I want you to double check. Just make sure people stay out of the area. Keeping bystanders and the crew safe. Make sure we keep in good communications with the pilot when he takes off. General safety precautions includes not approaching the aircraft until it's completely shut down, especially the tail rotor, and really not approaching the helicopter until one of us comes out and, and summons you forward, just to make sure that we're ready for you and the tail rotor is completely shut off. The EC-135, we do load and unload in the back with the clamshells, but we'll assist you with that. So we ask that emergency medical services never approach the aircraft from the back. As an emergency department, while we're always ready for anything and we can always mobilize resources, with Airlift Northwest, they call us early on in the process to let us know uh, the status of the patient, any interventions that they have provided. This helps us be uh, very well prepared for the patients when they arrive in the emergency department. I would encourage first responders to call Airlift as early as possible and to not be afraid to use them. They're a great resource. They're a resource that really helps the patient care in the end. They're some of the most committed, most talented, uh, hardworking staff. They truly believe in the mission. We're all passionate about what we do, and when you come to work in the morning, you know that you're gonna make a difference. Every day you make a difference, and that's huge. Mm -hmm.